around those seminar series. Uh, I, uh, you are not the people to say to, but uh, we start the seminars on time. So tell all the other guys later. Uh, so yeah, uh, we decided to start uh, gently, no computer science, no discrete math, a little bit talk about algebraic geometry. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so hi everyone, uh, my name is Gil, uh, and I will talk about AG codes. So it's half computer <coughs> science, I guess, half. AG stands for algebraic geometry codes. These are also known as GOPA codes for the inventor in uh, more or less 75, 1975. And uh, uh, I kind of need to know your background. So I guess most of you are CS and related. So how many knows algebraic geometry you know, better than I do? <laughs> 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 Can you invite a few from the other <laughs> No, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm afraid of. This is exactly. Um, OK, so, so my, my stated goal in this talk won't be to, I mean, we are definitely not going to learn algebraic geometry here. Uh, uh, nevertheless, we, we will be able to define to some extent, to some formalism, what AG codes are. And my goal would be to um, uh, make you interested in learning that, uh, kind of intrigued about you know, what's going on about, you know, beyond, beyond this code. And I think of AG codes as uh, just uh, for this talk as a kind of a killer application for something that we should all care about. Uh, because, you know, in TCS we care about polynomials. We use them all the time in different contexts. And uh, algebraic function fields, which is what, which is the math underlying these things, we don't really use the, you know, whole of algebraic geometry, just the uh, algebraic curves, which is essentially the same thing as algebraic function fields. So this is kind of a very natural uh, generalization of polynomials. And, you know, I would imagine that understanding this math uh, would, would, you know, would allow us to solve more problems besides for this one. And uh, for example, we also talk about small bias sets. So this is a second, less of a killer, but still a second application of uh, algebraic geometry or algebraic function fields. Um, and you know, by doing so, we'll be able to uh, go a little bit deeper even in, into this theory. So that's why I'm doing, going to do this. So the, the talk is going to be as follows. I'm going to just recap what codes are, especially mainly just to set notations. I, I kind of assume everyone knows what codes are. Uh, and then I'm going to hope to convince, to, to, you know, to motivate or uh, somehow explain a little bit about what, what is the underlying math behind AG codes then define AG codes, and we'll proceed from there, OK? So what are codes? Well, I have a big writing here. So, so we, know all, we all know what codes are. And in this talk, all of, all of our codes will be linear. So we have an uh, alphabet, which is going to be just some finite field FQ for some prime power Q. And a code is just, right, it's just some subset of FQ to the n. So n will be the, you know, the block length. So it's some subset. It actually looks exactly opposite of that. It shouldn't be dense like that. Um, and again, we are only considering linear code. So our code is just going to be a subspace. OK? And the two parameters of a code are the dimension of the code, which is just you know, the dimension of the subspace. And we denote it by k. And typically, we would be interested actually in uh, the of the, the rate of the code, so-called. Just the normalized dimension, which will denote by rho. And uh, you know, this, this tells you how much points you have here, how, how dense is this code within fq to the n. And the second parameter is the distance. And for linear code, this is just you know, the, Heming the lowest Hamming weight among all the non-zero code words. So this is just you know, the minimum. So this is Hemingway and non-zero entries, right? And this is usually we denote it by D. And again, we'll be uh, interested in normalize that because it uh, kind of simplifies things. And this is denoted, so this notion is the relative distance denoted by delta. OK, just two parameters. And of course, there is this you know, uh, tension between rho and delta. The bigger you make rho, the, so the more points you have there, so the harder it is to keep the distance large. So what you want to do is to make both of them large simultaneously. Right? And if you can, uh, OK, so let's see. So more quantitatively, 
So quantitatively, one way to write it is how large their sum could be. Okay? You can think of other functions of this, but how, how large the sum could be. And for first of all, the single singleton bound tells us that this is not one. You know, maybe plus one over n, but you know, don't worry about this little one over n here. Uh, so this is just the singleton bound, uh, very easy bound. And it's also uh, achievable by you know Reed Solomon codes. In general MDS codes are the ones that achieve that. So Reed Solomon achieved that. So for any row that you want, uh, you can uh, you can find a code with the distance which is uh, relative distance one minus that rate. Okay. Unfortunately, the alphabet size will be large. So in this case, if you want to achieve a rate which is row and distance which is data using Reed Solomon, then the alphabet size Q in this case, it will be n, or at least n, OK? And so the question is, you know, say you want a fixed alphabet size, or at least you want to kind of decouple the alphabet size. Uh, so what can you do? How, how well can you do? And you know, the, the best way to kind of set your expectation is to take a random say, you know, subspace or random set. And this is exactly what Gilbert and Varma Shamov did. Uh, one for linear and one for general sets. Uh, and what they proved is that, so this is Gilbert Varashamov bound from mid-50s, 52 and 59. Anyhow, so what they proved is that uh, you can actually, this is a kind of a positive result from our angle. You can actually get a code with the rate rho, distance delta, and you can set them any way you want to adjust it. As long as their sum is uh, at least something like that. So some constant c, which, which I don't know, and, uh, and uh, you know, so as long as uh, your rho plus delta, so you can make rho and delta close to one, but not that close, and the larger the alphabet size that you will allow, the closer you can get. Okay, so this is the Gilbert Varshamo. It, it's not explicit, so you can do it either using a probabilistic method or kind of a greedy algorithm, uh, but none of them takes polynomial time; all of them exponential time. And you cannot verify if it worked. So it's really an exponential time algorithm. And you know, for a while, I mean, not for a while, I mean, I wasn't there, obviously, but uh, to my understanding, it was a great shock that this is actually not tight. OK, typically, there are only very few examples where the probabilistic method gives you something which is uh, not optimal or very close to optimal. And it's usually only in cases where the structure is so strong that randomness won't, is not the right answer. And here, it doesn't seem to be the case, I mean, generally. And nevertheless, it is true. So uh, based, on Gopa, based, based on the ideas that initiated by Gopa, which I'll say in a second, uh, this was, again, mid-70s. Mid uh, it's Fassman, Vladut, and Zinc. I think it was 82, were able to kind of uh, instantiate Gopa's idea with a specific uh, function field. We'll see what that is. And they managed to get rho plus delta code that has rate rho relative distance delta such that this is you know, much better. right? So the dependence in Q is exponentially actually better than what probabilistic method gives you. And for any Q which is, you know, square root of Q kind of uh, makes sense. For any Q which is a <coughs> even prime, even power of a prime. OK? So I don't know. I mean, the way it is written, it's not clear if it's that great. But it is that great, right? I mean, um, OK, so I, want to, so I want to tell you how does this work? How does these codes look like? So uh, again, uh, not again, but I haven't said it. So feel free to ask me any question. Uh, yeah, p doesn't have to be a prime. It's like p to the two m for prime p. Yes. And uh, uh, you know, for some people, it's really interesting to ask what happens when a, when it's not a even prime power. So for cube, something is known, but you know, from our perspective, it's uh, we, don't care. we don't care. Yes, uh, not at this point. Uh, okay. How tight is it? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, well, no one knows. But using AG codes, using out of this mythology, it is tight. Exactly like that. So it, yeah, in some framework, it's tight. And it's the framework which it captures everything, we'll say. Right. Are there any upper bounds in terms of Q below 
Uh, I mean, yeah, but uh, you can, uh, yes, there are se several of those. Uh, they are still far from that one. So it's not tight, it's not close to the upper bound, but the techniques that gives you that won't give you anything better. That's what I'm saying. And it's, it's not a kind of, it's not a clean way to write it down. So I, uh, okay. there, there is, I, I don't that know one if- one is not on all plus delta, right? It's something that doesn't look linear. Right, exactly. So you have like, yes, you have like entropies going on and stuff like that. So I, yeah, say, saying that, okay, this is kind of oversimplifying thing. Say that I want all plus delta to be close to something. It's just one, one way of asking the question of how can you make O and delta large simultaneously. But uh, for example, Gilbert Roshamov is actually, it's not really delta, it's like uh, entropy of delta. So I'm a bit lying here. Gilbert Roshamov gives you something a little bit better, but not that better, so I'm not lying that much. In some sense, okay. Uh, right. And the dependency Q goes into this, yeah, there is no clean form that I'm aware of that gives you. But it's, it's, not, it's not tight in the sense that we know it's the best you can do generally. In particular, this is not better than Gilbert or Shamov for Q, which is small. For example, for two, it's wide open. Uh, I don't know what that is, but I know you can kind of maybe interpret a little bit. But uh, the best, the smallest Q for which this is actually better than that is like 49. Okay, just do the calculation. If you have C, you can do the calculation and see that. Does it matter kind of how does it behave along this frontier of rho versus delta? Is it worse? One of the endpoints? Oh, uh, well, I care mostly about the case where both of them are kind of bounded below by 0.0001 or something. But uh, yeah, you, you might be able to say something about the these two regimes where you are. Yeah, I, I don't, I need to think about it. Yeah, I typically care about, I want both of them to be constant and I want them to be large. Yes. These are called good codes uh, sometimes. Yes. Because uh, they have both rho and delta bounded below by constants. Okay, so how does this work? And this is what I care about. I care less about, I mean, I care a lot about the result, but I care more about the techniques. Uh, okay, so the codes that we are used to, I mean, some of them at least, are not only linear, but they're actually what's called evaluation codes. So what's an evaluation code? So an evaluation code is a code where with each code word, so with each C, you, actu you actually associate some function. So let's call it C of F. And in Ritz Solomon, these are going to be low degree polynomials. And on top of that, so that uh, way of associating a function with a code word, you also have a kind of fixed points of evaluation. In Ritz Solomon, it's just going to be some points in the field, P1 to Pn. So these are just, you know, just it lies in the definition of the code itself. And then this code word C that is associated with this function F is just the application, the evaluation of f to each of these uh, points, right? This is how it works for many codes, for many linear. This is clearly linear. Uh, well, so f the functions come from a linear. Yes. So if if the functions come from a linear space, this is linear, uh, and it's actually kind of more structured, right? You just apply some function to these points. So in Reed Solomon, right? The f the functions that you evaluate are just low degree polynomials. So you choose the degree, you can choose the degree higher or smaller depending on what you want between rho and delta. But regardless of how you choose it, um, you eva the evaluation points are just some, essentially the field itself, or some subset of size n of the field. But there's almost no reason to choose Q much larger, so you don't do, you don't do that anyhow. Right, so, so this is this is Reed-Solomon code. You just evaluate low degree polynomials over the field. And what Gopa said was, well, you know, why, why choosing these two? Why choosing uh, the functions to be low degree polynomials? And why choosing the evaluation point to be just some subset of FQ or even uh, all of FQ? It seemed arbitrary, uh, especially this part. Uh, and it's true. So. Well, I mean, wh which function are you going to evaluate and where? So the, the answer is kind of very well, I mean, it's, it's completely ready if you know algebraic function fields. So algebraic function field is kind of the algebraic, uh, well, algebraic uh, treatment for, algebra for learning uh, curves. 
So let me just give you some. Uh, let me just give you something. So, say you are looking at uh, f q and f q. Okay. So a curve, at least in this plane, would be just a solution to some polynomial equation in x and y. So this is kind of the x the x axis, the y axis, and a curve looks like that. Okay. This is all solutions to f p of x y equals zero. For example, maybe, you know f of x, y is y minus x squared. Okay, and then you get this parabola. Okay, which not, doesn't really look like a parabola over a finite field. But. Okay, so this is, an, this is an algebraic curve. You sometimes want to restrict it to be nice, but don't worry about that for this talk. Uh, you want it to be non-singular and irreducible and all kind of stuff like that, but uh, you know, don't worry about that. In codes, we, are, we choose what we want. So we, we don't have to face with things that don't have the properties that we want them to have. And what Gopa said is that, well, you know, we understand algebraic curves very well. So we are definitely going to take the points of evaluation, in some sense, on that curve. Uh, but what are the functions? So wh what, what, functions, what kind of functions do we care about? So you, you define the set of points on which this, this curve is just a set of points on which we will develop. No, no, okay, so, 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 so yeah, it's easy. sorry for the confusion. So we are going to have this curve, which is just essentially a set of points, solutions for this equation. These are not the points of valuation. We'll, I'll say what did that in a second. Yes, uh, so first let me say what are the functions that we are going to, to work with. So the functions that we are going to work with are going to be rational functions in two variables. For example, you can think of you know, y over x, and you know x, so you know x plus one divided by y squared minus three if you have a three and etc. Uh, so these are the functions. Immediately it kind of looks bad because as opposed to its hormone, you can't even evaluate that at zero, right? So all you have to worry is about poles and the issues of you know where can you or cannot you evaluate a point, a function on a point. This is this is the heart of the matter actually. And a second issue is that. Uh, it's not really clear what are the poles. For example, it seems like this function is not defined at zero, right, on, the, on this curve, right? Because you know you have y over x, so you can't put just a zero in x. But actually, you can, right? I mean, uh, because these are the same function. In the sense that if we just care about how the functions behave on the curve, then you can identify. This is what you do: you identify functions that agree on that curve. So if you do that, if you do that, and you can formalize this uh, algebraically then you have uh, this, this issue of representation. So different fu the same function could have different representation. And then it's not really clear uh, uh, where are the poles and the zeros of that function. So again, so, our, so by, by our functions will be our functions, the functions that we are going to be evaluate, going to be some subset. We are not going to choose all of them, but some subset of rational functions in x and y, like this, but where we consider only, uh, we, we, we identify two functions if they agree on the curve, okay? Up to this curve, okay? So for example, these two functions are exactly the same. And uh, so you see, you can evaluate x at zero here, even though it doesn't do it. And the reason is not only because it is the same, and here you definitely can put x equals zero, it's really because, you know, okay, so x has a kind of a pole at, at uh, x has a zero at, at uh, zero, but when that happens, y has two zeros because of, because y equal. And so even though this guy has a zero, this has two, and overall you have a zero there. So anyhow, there is this issue of representation which makes the whole thing much more interesting but challenging to work with. So let me just say, I mean, I, this, is the, this is the part of the talk where I hand wave a semester, so this is the only part that will happen, so you know, bear with me for a second. So the functions that we are going to consider are of that form. We are, going to be, should be, we are going to be very careful about where we evaluate functions. This is the whole, this is what the theory gives you. It gives you the answer to what can you and cannot you evaluate, etc. cetera. Uh, and the points of evaluation are going to be, so once we choose our functions, the point of evaluation will be uh, you know, points where we actually can evaluate these functions, where we don't get infinities or we don't try to evaluate a function at some place where it's not defined. Like in this case, maybe 1 over x. Uh, well, 
yeah, whatever x cubed or something, right? Which is, is not defined. So yeah, so this is this is this is ha a very hand wavy, and again, you should bear with me. It's, it's okay if you have a vague picture for now because I don't see how you can have a better picture given what I said. Um, so let me try to take you to a more familiar territory and then go back to, to here to this part as uh, again. So let's consider the rational function field. Oh. We, we scale all the time there. The rational function field over x. It's already bigger than kind of what we talk about when you do re, you know read Solomon codes, because this this includes function like one over x, etc. Right? And let me ask you, ask you a, a simple question. This is the question that uh, interested Riemann in the you know mid uh, 1800s, 1900s, 19th century. So uh, you know what are all functions? So all functions here, so all rational functions, x plus 1 divided by x cubed minus 4. What are all functions uh, that have, so let me cook up a good example, um, at least 1, 0, uh, say, you know, x equals 3, OK? So I require you to have a zero there. So you already have some examples in mind, right? And so this is a requirement. I require you to have one zero somewhere, but I'm going to allow you something also. And at most, uh, say two poles at x equals one, but only there, and no poles anywhere else. OK. So this is the question. Can I use this uh, for you guys? Well, maybe David is so just. Yeah, so you should have an answer already right now. Finish this. So give me one function, this is a simple one, the simplest one that you can. Hopefully I did the example correctly. Wow. I will make that yeah. one. X minus, X minus three. three. Right, this is a, yes. So one doesn't obey the requirement, but X minus three does. Right, so you, any, anyhow, it's going to be a multiple of X minus three, right? So this is one example. Any other example? Because now you, you're allowed to do stuff. Right. So I choose one there, so it's one. OK, this is one example, but I haven't allowed two poles, right? So we can also divide by the. So these are three examples. And <coughs> of course, any linear combination will do also, right? You can multiply by the other polynomials. And I can multiply by other polynomials. And any, any linear combination will do, right? So, even, so, so what I kind of want to say is that, well, we cannot multiply by other polynomials, not because you're incorrect, just because I, um, I uh, will add a restriction now. We can definitely add the polynomial as the way it's written. Uh, but even even it's even one of these guys is not okay. Even you can I mean you you're fine you did you did well but I am going to add another restriction which won't allow one of these, and it, it's you know it's essentially it means I'm going to work in the projective plane, and you should think of it as I'm kind of adding the point at infinity as a valid point. Okay, so if I can, if I'm allowing you to add infinity, just like in the calculus sense, okay? So which function here has a pole at infinity? Which function is not defined when you, the first one, right? So this is at infinity is infinity. Again, it's completely informal, but, but uh, nice, it's nicely enough that uh, it's, it's uh, kind of the same as you think of it as in the kind of limits calculus way of thinking. So this guy has a pole at infinity, which we don't use to think of. So kind of you should think out of the box here. But this guy is, is a, well, it's 1 at infinity, and this is 0 at infinity, right? And this is why now we cannot add more polynomials, because right, if it's you know, a root of 2, then you, I mean, if, you have a, if you have some polynomial here, the overall degree will be too large, and it will give you a root. 
at infinity. So we have two solutions here, just these two, and actually it's a subspace. It's, you can take any linear combination, it will, it will do. Right, so we have two solutions. And in general, you can show that, well, let me just have some notation to be able to, to write it down. So there is this notion called a divisor that allows you to take these, uh, you know, what you require and what you allow and to just write it nicely in, in this formal sum. So for us, a divisor will be just a, a very short way of writing these three lines. So this, the divisor corresponding to this question is uh, at least two zeros. It's always confusing. Yeah, actually, did you say what you meant by saying that this goes to one and the other goes to uh, zero? Yeah, j just in the calculus way, when you put x okay. equal infinity. But over finite fields? Too. Yeah, yeah, over finite fields, it breaks completely. It makes no sense to do that. But uh, as it turns out, the, the way to actually do that, which is completely algebraic, coincides nicely in that example with, with what you do. So yeah, it make, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Um, if you know about projective planes, then you just you ca you look at the projective plane as opposed just to this affine plane. But uh, OK, but uh, yeah, the, the best way to think about it is, uh, well, I don't know, for this talk, it's just like that. Uh, because it's the same, it's the same, the same kind of uh, world that you are having. So it's just the question about the degrees. And it's, it's all the same in the algebraic case. So the reason this is one, just because the degrees are the same. And the reason this is zero. And degrees are an algebraic thing, so you can actually formalize them. OK. A any more questions? Uh, this is slightly less vague than the beginning, I hope. It, it will be better and better with time. Uh, OK, so the divisor corresponding to this question is, I'm just going to define it to you, is OK, so you, you require, require it, we will have it with a minus, because this is how it's used. You require one pole, sorry, one zero at uh, x equals three. So we write it this way. So we have this point, which will, we don't write three because we need to look like the answer is like minus three. So just p three. Uh, if you want p x equals three, and then you allow me two uh, poles at uh, the point one. Right. So this is how we can write a divisor. And then you, you can ask, you know, you can just translate any such question to a divisor, just a formal sum. It's nothing. Nothing deep happened here. But uh, it's nice because now you can define the degree of a divisor. So in, in general, so the degree of this divisor is just minus 1 plus 2, which is 1, which measures how much you allow versus how much you, how much you require. Right? The minuses are taking our requirements, and the pluses you know, gives you some freedom. So this is the amount of freedom that you have. So this is the degree of a divisor. In general, if you write a divisor like that, where these are just positive or negative integers, then the degree of the divisor is going to be some n i. OK, so the degree of a divisor, in some sense, is uh, how much freedom you allow. OK? And the question is, you know, given the degree of a divisor, how much functions sits in this, in this set of solutions, in the subspace of solutions. OK? And uh, this subspace has a name. It's called the Riemann-Roch space of the divisor associated with that divisor. So this is the Riemann-Roch space. And the question is, you know, what can you say about the, the dimension of that? This is the main question. Here. What can you say about the dimension of that subspace, the, you know, the number, essentially, of solutions? Uh, Collinear dependence with respect to the degree of the divisor. Can you say something interesting? So, yes. so this is uh, just, uh, it seems like the, the number of degrees of freedom should have been two, but again, because of projectivity. Right. So it's a line. The subspace, the linear yeah. space generated by these two is a line. Uh, yes. Two right. So yes. It seems like two degrees of yes. freedom. Two right. Degrees of freedom, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, definitely, yes. Uh, I mean, think of it as a, OK. Yes. Yeah. So the requirement is always about 0, the what you allow is about poles. Yes. Yes, this is the only game. Yes, this is the only game that you play. Um, so, so here in, in the rational function field, right, you saw that if the degree is, uh, well, in this case, this, is 1, then the dimension of the subspace is 2. 
And it's kind of easy to convince yourself that uh, the following is kind of a <coughs> kind of trivial statement here, that the dimension of the subspace is the degree plus 1. OK? This is, this is nothing more than that. And the question is what happens in general, for general function fields. So k of x is just some, so sorry, f q of x is just some function field. So it's just some curve. It doesn't look like a curve, really, but it's just some curve there. It's, a, it's kind of a line. Uh, you can take uh, x equals y, and when you didn't benefit by adding y to your um, field. And the question is, you know, in general, I give you a kind of a weird curve, which, make, which is kind of smooth and non-singular, but still a weird curve, an arbitrary curve, more or less. And I ask you, I mean, I, I, I require, you know, some, I require, I want at least 0 here, 2 zeros there, etc. but I allow you, allowing you some poles. How many solutions are there as a function of the curve, as a function of phi? OK? And so, right, so, the, so this, is, this is a theorem over fq of x. And the question more generally is, you know, if you, have, if you add y to this and under some, you know, algebraic relation of x, how many solutions do you have? And this is the, the kind of the famous Riemann-Hoch theorem that tells you the answer to that question. So let me just write it there. We will actually only need the Riemann part. It's called Riemann inequality. It, it was proven before. Roch was a student of him. It was proven before Roch joined. Uh, and the answer is, is, uh, is, I mean, it's quite interesting. So, I mean, in the sense that it didn't have to be quite elegant, and it is. So, so the Riemann Roch theorem, I mean, again, actually only need. Uh, just the Riemann part of it, and it's, I, I don't remember the exact year, but it's like something like that, okay? Um, it says that for any a phi, which is the curve, just the defining equation of the curve, and for any divisor, so for any, you know, I want that many zeros, but I allow that many poles, the dimension of the riemann roch space associated with that divisor is at least, and the riemann roch is an equality, but it's at least the degree of the divisor plus 1, which is what we had just for the simple case. But you lose something, OK? Uh, and amazingly, what you lose is independent of d. It depends only on phi, on the function phi. And it's called the genus. So this is g of phi, not D. Okay, this is the genus. It's a property of the function field itself. Okay, so you know you want many solutions. Uh, I mean, given some set of constraints, but you know you allow some flexibility, you allow some freedom. You want many many solutions, and what you get is that well, the maximum number of solutions you can partially Im imagine minus some loss, and that loss is essentially uh, necessary. In the sense that, uh, so there is a second part here. Uh, so it's not only that, but if you consider a, a device, divisors with high degree, with degree which is at least something like 2g minus 1, if the degree of the divisor 2g minus 1, then you get equality. OK, so in, initially there is this noise, but we're actually using that noise, so I don't want to call it noise. Uh, there is this irregularity, and then there is the, then you understand kind of everything. Then for any another uh, pole that you allow, you get one more in the, in the dimension. You get one more function sitting there. Then actually you get this thing with equality. Okay. And this you learn in any not that I took one, unfortunately, but you learn in any you know, basic course in algebraic curves, or function field, or algebraic geometry, if you take it to some extent. Um, OK. Yeah, so the genus is the number for which is fault for us. But uh, it has a topological meaning. It's you know, the, the holes in the donut thing that's going on there. I won't talk about it at all. Um, 
Yes, but you can define the genus. It's, it's not, it wasn't really a joke, it was a theory. You can define the genus as, I will say that in, in, in the second part of the lecture, as essentially, well, in algebraic terms. But it's, yeah, but the topological angle, you know, is, is nice also. In the complex, in, I mean, when you talk about, you know, okay. So over function, over, you know, finite fields, it's kind of uh, less obvious uh, if it's helpful, but. Yes, exactly. So yeah, so this is how we define it. Uh, the fact that there is such a number uh, is amazing. And uh, for example, the genus of the Russian function field is zero. That's why this happens. And uh, if you know about elliptic curves, the, the genus there is one. It's kind of essentially an equivalent really condition. And hyper elliptic, elliptic is uh, genus two, and, and you can continue on. And we'll see. We'll see much more about it in the second part. But you know, what only, the only thing I want to, to get is that there is this cool notion of uh, you know you can take a curve phi, and once you choose a divisor, there are a set of functions that are that you kind of understand how many of them are there once you set the restrictions about where they are defined, where they po where are not defined, what where are the poles, etc. So I want to use that to give you Gopa codes to just show you the construction itself, okay? Okay. So here is Gopa's suggestion, and we'll see how it uh, generalizes Reed Solomon. Hopefully it will help. So a Gopa code. So Gopa suggested a uh, kind of a, a, an abstract template for constructing codes. And as I said, this was instantiated by, uh, in later works, I will say afterwards something about the references. Uh, so this is a, uh, this this will have essentially no parameters here. Okay? What you're going to do is you are going to define a code and associate the parameters of the code, the distance and rate, with the parameters of the function field that you're using. Okay? And then the goal would be to find good function fields. Because maybe maybe you cannot, maybe it's maybe it's a good a nice reduction, but at the end of the reduction you have nothing interesting to say. So here are GOPA codes defined. So what you do is choo you choose a function field. Okay, so for us it's just this curve. And you are going to take all, all points, this is, maybe I'm taking back what I said to Avi, all points on that curve. Okay, so this is P0, P1, Pn. So we are going to have, so we, for example in this picture, yeah, I'm definitely going to take back what I said. So in this picture, if you have fq by fq, and this is your curve, this is the set of solution, then I'm just going to take, you know, there are some solutions, some n plus 1. It's nice to have one of them, which is 0. So n plus 1 solutions. And these are just, you know, what you see there, p0. Plus. But I, I should say that, you know, if you move to, you know, if, if you move some, to some extension, to fq squared or something, you get kind of more points, right? Maybe, sometimes. And you continue on, you can get more. Uh, uh, because you can because you can factor some irreducible polynomials better and better, which plus some the on the curve, plus the highest. yes. So so those we do not consider. We we only consider what's called rational points, points over FQ, okay, FQ solutions to these equations. If you want to consider FQ squared, then the entire thing will be a code over alpha beta is Q squared. So it's a different story altogether, and you can just start where start at Q squared and not at Q. So these are what's called rational points. Okay, so there. Are, so once you choose phi, n is essentially fixed. You, you you either know it or don't know it, but you have some number of rational points. You want this to be kind of a lot. Okay, um, it will be at most q squared, of course, the way it's written, because you have just you know. But uh, you can you can extend it. You can take extension. Really extension. Not that you want a lot. In some sense, you also want. Oh, you want a lot. <laughs> yes, you want a lot. Uh, given the that you don't. Gain is actually right. Is exactly. Important. Right, right. That's true. You want a lot, but uh, yeah, you can take everything, but then you're going to lose in some other parameter. So you want a lot while keeping some other parameter right. And we'll see exactly this tension. This other parameter it turns out to be the genus. So you want a lot by keeping the genus. Uh, what do you mean by rational points? Well, just, uh, just all solutions in FQ to these equations. So these are really just, so this is PI, it's just this, this, this set. So this P1, P2. 
zero is going always to be p infinity, but who cares? Uh, like okay, so you take a, a algebraic curve, you take its solutions over fq, but the projective one, you also take the infinity. Don't worry about too much about that. And rational, rational comes from the rational. Don't yes. Know, it's, uh, x squared minus 2. There's no rational solution. Yes. So they live in an extension of the rational. That's the source of Yes, the names come from algebraic number theory. Yes. Um, actually, I, to me, most of these, because we're working over finite fields, uh, the treatment that you need comes more from uh, algebraic number theory than algebraic geometry. Uh, but you know, the, the, the problems that you have to consider are also the ones shared by, by you know, people that did algebraic number theory. So when you try to learn this, you have to look at kind of courses about uh, algebraic number theory as well. OK, so anyhow, so you have this curve and you have these points. And now what we're going to do is we're going to define, so for, so for some parameter r, this is an integer. It's just going to be, you know, you don't need to think about it too much. This is going to be how rho is, you know, r determines rho. And the delta will be just, you know, decreased as, as you increase the rho. But, you know, for some r, this is an integer, OK, a positive integer. We are going to, we are going to look at the riemann roch space associated with this divisor. I'm just giving a specific example here, but that's enough for us. So I'm going to take on functions that have at most, I'm allowing you at most r poles at some place, at some point. But I'm not allowing to, you to have any <laughs> poles anywhere else. Okay. So this is just some set of functions that, has, that they, they may have r poles at p0, but no poles anywhere else. You don't have, pla you know. And is the curve right? Yes. Uh, so yeah, I haven't really defined carefully, but the functions are rational functions. Uh, so you still identify them. Yes. 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 And only in that context, this theorem holds. Yes. And uh, so the code is the following. So your code is just. So this is your code. It's very similar to what we said earlier. You take a function here, any function here, and you just evaluate it in all other place, places. They call places. Sometimes I say places, but all other all other points. Okay. So first of all, it makes sense. I mean, every function here only has pole at p zero, so you can evaluate it at p one till p n. Right? That, that's okay. And uh, so I mean, at least you don't see infinity zero. Right. And the question is, you know, what are the parameters of these codes? And before doing that, let me show you that. Let me just make sure that. This is uh, like P0 will be infinity. Yes. Exactly. So. Exactly. So even for. Even for. Uh, yeah, you so can do it. Yes. No, no, but read Miller actually is, is good because you have X and Y here. I'll just do it for here. So even for read Solomon. So the function field for read Solomon would just be K of X. And if you don't like it, you can add y, but x equals y, or so, yeah. y equals 1. No, x equals y. And then p0 exactly will be p infinity, so you know, the point at infinity, in the sense that you know, what are all rational functions so in x that have at most r poles at infinity? So these are exactly all the polynomials of the most r. Right? Because you, are, you know, x has one pole at infinity, x squared has 2, x squared has r. Um, so this includes like one, you know, okay, one x, and and then the points, the other points that you take are just all the kind of normal points, like not the infinity points. And then then you just use the kind of fundamental theory of algebra to say what something about the degree, about the distance versus the dimension, right? You just know that if you have polynomial of degree r, it has at most r roots, so you can bound the number of zeros that you see here. So we are going to use another uh, little lemma. In order to say something about the distance and the rate of this code, so the lemma is the following: It says that it's a simple lemma. I, probably it follows from Van Roch, but it's not fair. You use that to prove that. So, uh, so it just says that if you allow 
uh, less than you require. So if you take a divisor and its degree is negative, you require more zeros than you allow poles, right? Then there is nothing there but for the, the zero function. So the dimension of the corresponding riemann roch space is zero. Technically, you need to add zero there all the time, but the dimension is zero. Okay, this kind of makes sense, right? If you are, if you require more, even in the uh, even in this uh, function field, which is the nicest one, which you lose nothing by 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 requiring more, you just you just lose what you have to lose. Even there, this holds. Okay, so this is the analog of the fundamental theorem of algebra that you use. Okay, so I'm going to use that little lemma to show you to relate the parameters of that code with the parameters of the underlying function field, namely the genus and the number of rational points, the number of points on the curve. So you're, you're still afraid of zeros? No, no, zeros are okay. I mean, I don't have too many zeros. So you still, that's your goal? Yes. The number yes, 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 yes. I mean, I was afraid of infinity just, you know, for sanity check. Now I'm afraid of zeros because I want this to be a good code. Yes. Oh. So let's see, it's not hard. Let's just do it. I don't have a good grab on this. Okay. So, uh, well, what's the dimension of the code? It's really just the dimension of the Riemann Roch space, right? Associated with R times P0. Uh, which is R. Oh, no. <laughs> which is, you know, by Riemann Roch theorem, this is the, the degree is simple, the dimension. So by Riemann Roch theorem, we know to say something about the dimension of this thing, right? It's at least the degree, this is R. Right, the degree was defined to be the sum of these guys, so it's just R. Uh, plus one minus g, right? This holds for any r and for large enough r's, it's actually tight, so you don't gain much if you look at kind of high degree divisors. Okay, so this is just dimension of the code. Dimension of the code is really just the dimension of the function of you know the f of sorry where f is taken from, and we use a heavy machinery to bound this dimension here by something which is easy by just this number r, but we pay this g here, okay? What's the distance of the code? This is the more interesting part. In general, yes. Yes. So for yeah. So. Yeah. So for for any curve. Yeah with that rational points, okay. and that genus G. Right, so G is a function of, yeah, so, right. So I'm, so Gopa said, you know, I, I'm not going to bother choosing a curve, um, even though it, you know, you, you should, right? You, you need to see it make some, make some improvement. So yeah, so I'm just going to associate the parameter of the curve with that of the, the parameter of the code with that of the curve. Yeah, but yes. the curve, but in the definition of the curve, there is no curve, there's just set of points. No, no, but, the, but, the, but these points and these uh, Riemann Roch space are associated with the curve. Yes, right? it didn't say, but, uh, yes okay. Is there a there yes, yes, yes. All the time, yes. Right. So there is a fee in the background. So, yes, yeah, so yeah, I just. Yeah, at the beginning of the GOPA code, all fee ones and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Right, you should uh, parameterize everything with fee. I mean, the dimension of RP0 is different for different. Uh, fees and you know the even p0 you can choose it essentially but Riemann Roch firm tells you it doesn't really matter what p0 you choose only the degree matters which is r and then the Riemann Roch tells you that the dimension is r minus this g plus one so who cares what you choose right so just choose one of them uh, so what's the distance of the code so the distance of the code well it's kind of easier to talk about the number of uh, so number of zeros, okay, n minus z, where z is the number of zeros, 
where z is just z is the okay what do i mean let me just yeah so okay so sorry let me just take f in i mean z could be different for different functions so take a uh, some function that is non-zero in this riemann roch space and i want to ask how many zeros does it have right i want to bound from below the number of zeros so let's say it has z zeros so let's say that you know Let's say these are exactly the zeros of that function. OK, there are some zeros at some z places, z points. So how can we bound the z from above, right? So the thing is this. We know that f lives in r times p0, right? And it's, it's a non-zero function. And we know that. We know that it has at most r poles. But you know, even if we assume that f is 0 at some place, we can actually kind of for free require that it has a 0 there, right? Because it has a 0 there. So it, it, it follows this criterion. Right? f actually sits not only here, but even here. So you allow r zeros, uh, sorry, r poles at 0, which is fine. But actually, if it has kind of many zeros, it sits in a lot smaller and smaller place here, right? Just because this set of restrictions is, you know, is respected with respect to f. Okay, but what? So the fact that this Riemann-Roch space is not trivial means its degree is at least zero, right? By well, I guess the contrapositive of this lemma. So this means that the degree of this guy of d, well, this is d, which is r minus z, just because the way we define degrees, just the sum of you know, the coefficients here is at least 0. Because if it was, right, OK. We said that if this is smaller than 0, this is empty. So the contrapositive is this, that one. And so the number of zeros is mostly degree, r. So z, you know, is at most r. And so the distance of the code, this is for any function that is non-zero, is at least n minus r, right? It have n points, uh, only z, which is most r of them, are zero, so this is the distance. OK, is, is this, does this OK? It's kind of the hardest part of, the, of this talk. Um, so it seems that you could also pick uh, maybe OK, because you say, well, you're going to pay for a 0. Yeah, you can pay for right. the price. Yes, this is, this is interesting. I haven't, yeah. we should talk. <laughs> um, Multiplicity. Yes, for edge codes, yeah. I think, OK. Yeah. Also, I didn't talk about increasing the dimension. So uh, like this, uh, it's more than two variables. Right, right. Two and you can do that, yes. This is actually, so let me just summarize the distance is at least n minus r and the dimension is at least r plus 1 minus g right so nicely enough the dimension plus the distance is at least n minus g plus 1 right so i told you r is just going to be your way to control the distance so and in other words rho plus delta which we cared about is at least, you know, forget about this one, it's kind of annoying, it only, only helps us, so it's at least 1 minus g over n. Right? This is kind of what I want to say. Stops you from taking a line. Right, so the question is, so, so why? So here is the question now. So you want to make this thing small, right? Because you see, you just got a code we where the distance. Yes, right, exactly. For a fixed Q, or not fixed, but for a Q I have in mind. Y you want, and yeah, I guess you, for a fixed Q, I mean, you can think of other stuff. But for a fixed Q, you ask, you know, how small can I make this thing? This is exactly the question now. And it's. Defining it. 
<laughs> well, I'm How smart can you make it without defining it? That's, that's a <laughs> well, that's easy. <laughs> uh, yes, so this is a, again, so what we have here, here we have the genus, which is, you know, we haven't defined. And we actually, well, and here we have the number of, the number of points, the number of rational points, the number of points you see in the curve. Right, so you want, you want a curve with many rational points, but with small genus, or at least compared to that number of points, you want a small genus. This is what you want. And the question is, how good can you make it? And um, OK, so there was some history to it. So, um, so there is a Hasse veil bound that gives you a kind of the right answer, but we care about the limits. They tell you something kind of even stronger, but it gives you something weaker because it says something stronger. So the fourth, to actually consider that variant, you know, for a fixed Q, for a fixed Q, how small can this thing be? He actually asked, you know, how big can the reciprocal be? But you have, and he defined this notion of uh, a of q. So q is the sub, is the is the size of the field, right? It's just going to be one of the limb soup. There is these issues. So you take n goes to infinity, then over g. Okay, in that sense. So you you fix some q. And you ask, you know, go over all possible curves, but I want them to go to infinity. Um, and how big can I make this thing? It's mo it makes more sense to study this way. And Do you need multiplicities? Otherwise, isn't them bounded by Q squared or something? Yes. So yeah. So the curve doesn't have to live in two dimensions, right? You can you can have a curve. What really happens is that you. You, you, you have some, uh, you know, you take the rational function field over x, you extend it with some equation phi to y, but then you consider a tower of it. You can take an extension of y to z, and then your curve lives in a 3 or 4 in whatever dimension. But the question remains, what's the genus of that thing? Right, so here, here, the, here it's, uh, plane curves won't give you much. You need to go to higher dimensions. But it's still going to be a curve. It's not going to be a high dimension object. It's just going to live in a big place. And the question was that, and, and the answer was kind of reversed. There was this. Uh, this is supposed to be Right. Yes, yes, yes. So you're right. So this is exactly a square root of minus 1, which gives you what I uh, talked about. And this was discovered. Uh, so there were many. So there was the. So the Fassmann, Vladut, Zinc from 82. Uh, proved that using modular curves, it was non-constructive. Okay, but it just showed that it exists. Okay. So just meeting it, he proved the he proved the alpha. Oh right, so oh, right, so right, so they proved that uh, they proved the law. The good result, yes. Yeah, so they proved that. Uh, sorry, well, in this <laughs> yeah, in this case, the law yes. So they proved that they, no, they, they proved that this is small. Yes, yeah. exactly. So this is a good result. I mean, they proved that for a Q, which is a even pra even power of a prime. Uh, you can get square root of q minus 1. And then uh, Sere used, a year later, used the class field theory to prove the yeah. same thing. Well, sir, I'm not sure, but I should, I should say immediately that I have no idea how to uh, really uh, explain this because I just read it all the time. So Sir, OK. So he proved the same thing. But then there was uh, the paper that is most close to us as a computer scientist, and that's the Garcia. Stichtendorf, okay, you will excuse me. Uh, this was mid 90s, okay, like 95 or something. Uh, Stichtendorf, actually. Yes, um, he has actually the you know the book on the subject, so you should know how to spell his name. But uh, yeah, they give uh, what we will call an explicit construction. They give the, the, they give the fees. OK, that does this. Um, and I will talk about it later. So this is a very big smile here. Uh, and then, actually, uh, here, after bet maybe between, I mean, uh, mid 80s, it was shown to be tight also. So that you cannot do better than square root of q minus 1. So this, this, li this limit cannot be better. Um, and so in that sense, AG code won't give you anything better than that uh, result. And this comes from some uh, zeta. Yes, exactly. They study zeta functions. 
Uh, I think it was based also on some, some result from ER. Uh, OK, so let's see. How much time do we have? I guess we kind of. Well, it's up to you if you want a break or not. And uh, yeah, we go to 12.30 unless you are interesting enough for us to continue. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> so I'll be happy with a break. I don't, I don't mind. Let's have a break. Like okay. You can choose five, ten minutes, whatever. You can say five and let them make Okay. Them Let's have a five minutes break and come time in ten minutes. And, uh, and, uh, and we'll continue to see small bias sets, which will dive us even further into this uh, GOPA algebraic function fields. Okay, so thanks. Yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe. Sorry, I don't know. Uh, we can wait. Uh, okay. So any questions so far? I mean, please feel free to ask. It's hard to ask questions when it's not that formal, but uh, you know. OK. So now I want to talk about small bias sets. And the reason I want to do so is because uh, there is this beautiful work, really beautiful, the one that uh, uh, got me interested in these things, enough to waste you know, a year of my life inventing this, uh, investing this. So, this is a work by uh, Amnon ben uh, Avi Benaroy and Amnon Tashma. And they constructed small bias sets that are kind of uh, incomparable with what we, what we knew before. But uh, the interesting part is that to do so, they had to be brave. And they had to understand the dimension of a riemann roch space without resorting to use riemann roch theorem. OK? So I will say exactly what I mean. But uh, they had to do some to just understand how some divisor behaves just by brute force. Just try to see what's going on there. And we'll do that. OK, so let's see what we should. Okay, this is kind of the. OK, you are, you are done. I'm not thank you anymore. It's not because of me, because of that. But I keep using the same one, so it's because it's the largest. OK, so what's a small bias set? So this, is, this was introduced by uh, uh, Naori Naori in 91, I think. Uh, OK. And so I'll just give the definition and then give some point of views on it just to have fun. Yeah, but the definition is the following. So we want a set in 0, 1 to the n. So it's not fq anymore, just 0, 1 to the n. Let's say to the k because it will be convenient for us. Um, and what you want is that uh, it kind of fools in our test. So in what sense you want that for any non-zero vector in 0, 1 to the n, you want that the following will hold. Yes. Yes, right. Yeah, you need addition there. Yes. Right. So here is what you want. If, if you like pseudo-random generators, you're kind of used to see these things. So what you want is that. You want to find a set, just a, hopefully a small set, in 0, 1 to the n of just strings. But you, you, there is also additive structure, so f to the k, so not n. And what you want is that this set will have the property that if you take the inner product of any vector, any test vector tau, with a random element from that set, then the bias that you will see, the number of zeros in one, will cancel each other more or less to, to, to some epsilon. OK, so picturally it looks like that. This is 0, 1, sorry, this is f2 to the k. What you want is to find some set of points. This is s, uh, such that for any tau, so which essentially you know, divides the f2 to the k to some subspace and its offset, roughly half of the points would be on each side. Right? This is the geometrical perspective of this thing. For the epsilon, it's called epsilon. Yes, right. So small is the general name. and. Once you require, once you have some epsilon in mind, you call it an epsilon biased set. Yes, thanks. 
And there is also, from the pseudo-anonymous computational pseudo-anonymous perspective, uh, this, is a, this is a set that fools linear tests, right? So a linear test, a linear function, linear, so any tau, if you give it a uniform string here, it will have uh, exactly the same number of zeros and one if you take the inner product for, for a non-zero tau. And so if you want to kind of full linear test, what you want is to find some distribution or some set from which you'll sample such that the inner product is close to that zero. So this is why we think of it as a, you know, a set that fools linear tests. Okay, and it's, it has like, you could fix me, but uh, 20 at least applications, this thing, right? Many more, right, easily 20. 20 I am aware of uh, very well. So, you know, this is, this is a very, it seems like you're not requiring a lot, but it's, it's, it's uh, very applicable. It's related to Fourier analysis, of course, because you, you just see the coefficients here. And you didn't see it, I said explicitly, you want S small. Yes. <laughs> that has no, no, uh, yes, yes. When you take, yeah, when you take uh, everything, it's easy. Um, so F2 to the K is a very good, right. the zero bias. Uh, right, <laughs> yes. And the question, you know, if you allow some error, how, how smaller in terms of N you can make that set? And so a uh, simple probabilistic argument shows that you can make S non-explicitly of size N over epsilon squared. So it's linear as opposed to exponential in okay? And this is also tied up to log one over epsilon factor there. So essentially tied. N, N, is, K. N, is, K. N is K. And N is always K, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I always use n, but here the, this k is going to be the k, this n, so I just have to up k. But in my mind, I haven't switched. Uh, yes. But these two are really n's. This is now and now. It's not uh, uh, okay. Okay. So this is what this is the holy grail. Okay. Now, what was known? So the, even the first now and now paper gave something which is very strong. So now and now. So we want an explicit construction of such set. And now we know gave something which is k over epsilon to some constant. I don't know what that constant is, seven or something. Okay, it depends on some parameters of other constructions. So it's optimal in k, but uh, well, polynomially related to what it needs to be in epsilon, not that bad. Very good start. Uh, this was 91, and then there was uh, the paper that actually got me interested in this pseudo randomness. So uh, the Alon, Golda, Hastad, Peralta paper, and they gave three constructions. So I don't know what was exactly the four people giving three constructions, but there are three different constructions. All of them gives the right dependence in epsilon, but the wrong one in k. Okay, k over epsilon squared. Uh, and then using uh, AG codes, which we'll see, uh, alone et al. But we know k over uh, epsilon cube. Yes, so this is. Oh, oh sorry. This, this oh, maybe it was before. No, this this not, yeah, this is no, no, this one. They they or at least they cited the yeah, if they they just noted that you can okay. Yeah. So we will we will we will we can talk about if it, well we can definitely use AJCO to do that. But I think they do. They just say that we you do what they did but just use AJCO instead. But maybe you can do it different. I, I okay, so I'll, let me just write it down and then I'm still proud of myself having K instead of N so far. K represent cubed. Okay, so it's you know better than that because that's larger than three in there. And yeah, maybe what you're referring to is that you can tweak this construction. I don't know if and get something like k over epsilon cubed times log squared of k over epsilon. Maybe is this what you no. okay. So just this you one. Don't need, right? you need just this and the last one, but it doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, I'll be happy to uh, okay, so this was all the nineties. I don't know if it was nineties. It's roughly the same years. I don't know even. So let's say 90 epsilon, 90 small. Okay. Um, and then there was this beautiful, beautiful work by uh, uh, Avi Ben Aroya and Amnon Tashma. This was 09. So far, uh, it's much closer to today. And they have a construction which is actually, is, you know, it's not optimal in any of them, but it's uh, still better in some regime of parameters, some natural ones. So they gave the right answer to the five quarters, okay? And uh, yeah, I don't know if I should share, but so they told me that, you know, you'll see this construction. So they, 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 they used kind of the simplest, they used a good idea with the simplest curve 
I mean, immediately they got this thing, and they even hoped that they could get you know something better by using a more elaborated uh, machinery, but uh, but they haven't. And then in a, in the journal paper after uh, after uh, using some ideas from uh, some work of Volokh, they showed that day technique cannot give you something which is better than k over two the epsilon two point five. So it won't give you the optimum uh, that you want, but it's it's still you know. Uh, very nice, and you can show it's kind of better than these guys when the epsilon is like 1 over k. But it's not really important for us. What's important is that it uses algebraic geometry, not in a black box manner, AG code not in a black box manner, but actually looks inside. So we are going to see, uh, well, you know. That's the best. They're incomparable. Yeah, they're incomparable. It's not a solved problem. No, no, no. no. That's a good problem. No, yeah. Yes. No, there's very small bias. Yes. Yeah, uh, this regime, this is a regime where epsilon is small. I mean, uh, epsilon, epsilon is more than we don't need. Yes. Usually, yeah. the, I mean, many people don't care because epsilon is. Uh, uh, I'm going to. In terms yeah. of seed length, it's like a constant. Yes. Because it's like a polynomial. It's almost so. Oh, it's. I always thought it was so. Well, I mean, you can think of it as a problem of cognitive. Yeah, none of them is uh, do, do they get uh, also results for lower degree tests? So uh, Viola proved that uh, no, they don't. But Viola proved that if you take you know t sample, these samples from small bias sets independent, you get you can fool the uh, d, d polynomials. But the dependence in these, uh, they it's like they all depends like exponentially in these. So but it's a black box. You don't yes, uh, you but don't it's about detect epsilon bias right. of such any of them. Or yes, any an interesting love. Yeah, the sum of samples is full the greedy polynomial. Yes. Initially, it uses uh, Gower's, but then you know. Uh, I think uh, Shachar has a two to the, the two sum of two to the d samples full degree d, and then it was reduced to d by Viola. But then what we will see is you know this guy, this guy, and that guy. Okay. And I'm more interested of that, but uh, it's just this is on the way. So, well, at least one of the free AG and HP construction. Yeah. Okay. So what's the idea? The idea is just to Essentially, take a code and concatenate it with Hadamard. But let me just uh, say exactly what I mean. So say you have a, a code, a linear code. It has to be a linear code, OK? I'm going to take a linear code and construct a small bias set out of it. And the parameters of the small bias sets will depend on the parameters of, of the linear code. So say a, lin a linear code, OK, so the alphabet side is going to be FQ. So FQ, sorry. And it's going to have dimension K, so these are the this is the generating matrix. So these are the k basis vectors. <coughs> and they live in uh, fq to the n. OK, the standard setting we said before. You know, fq to the n is where you live, and you have k dimension k. And the, the, de the distance will be delta as before, the relative distance. OK, so the way you're going, and let's assume that also q is just for fun. It's, it's just easier. q is some power of 2. You, it's not really important, but it will be slightly easier to do it, OK? So the way you make of it a small bias set is as follows. You are going to construct a 0, 1 matrix here. So F2, the number of rows is going to be n times the alphabet size q, OK? And you'll have a column for column. And it's really just concatenating with Adamar. What you're going to do is you're going to take this fourth entry and replace it with Q entries. Right, so this entry, this one entry in FQ goes to Q entries in F2 just by taking all possible inner product of that string. OK, so you think of this as an L-bit string. You kind of associate the field of F2, the two elements, with the subspace of uh, dimension L over 2, over F2. And you just you know if this is some x, then this is in a product of x and y for any y in 0, 1 to the L. Okay, you, can, you don't have to have this. You don't have to have q to be 2 to the L, but it's just nicest to describe it this way. 
Okay, it's very simple. Just, it's really concatenation with random hard research going on. But I just want to write it explicitly. So is it okay? The construction is fine. Every, so this first entry is translated to this vector. The second, with the, the second entry will translate to, a, to the second vector here. So this will have NQ rows altogether. So on the left is the generating matrix? Yes, so the left here is the generating matrix of code. Yes. Yes. So let's now let's see wh wh so what's the small bias set here. The small bias set is going to be just the rows of this matrix. Okay, so S1 is going to be the fourth element in this set, S2 we're trying to construct. And S and Q is going to be the, the last one. And you see it lives in 0, 1 to the Q, F to the Q, K. So this is what I try to make it K, not N, uh, as, as hard as I could. So why does it work? I mean, what's the uh, any any set is a epsilon bias set for some epsilon. So what's the epsilon of this thing, right? So right. So let's see. So we have a set. Let me just say it's of size n times q. This is the reduction. So the set size is going to be the dimension in which this code lives in, or lived in, and it also multiplied by q, which is kind of bad. You don't want this set to be large. Where q is the alphabet size of the code. And it sits in 0, 1 to the k, in f2 to the k. And what's epsilon? OK. So do you see what epsilon is? So you're going to analyze it by block. Yes, exactly. So the analysis go by block, right. So you say, you know, take any linear combination. Tau. Tau just, you know, chooses some indices, right? So a test is just, you know, I'm going to take the parity of the fourth, fifth, and you know, seven index of the so it's really just it's really just characterized by, by some set of columns, right? And what you're going to do, so this this is tau. This is just, you know, this is the ones of tau and these are the zeros of that vector. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a the inner product of tau, so you d you're going to take you know these columns and take their inner product and see what's the bias of what you get, right? So let's see. Let's so let's see. Once you take this tau, once you take you know, the, in the the inner product of these taus, it kind of induces what induces something that's going on here. It induces what happens when you look at the code word obtained by taking the linear combination according to tau of that corresponding basis elements. Right, for example, if tau is just one, just E1, like the one zero 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 zero, then what you're asking is what's the bias of the first bit, where the bias is taken with respect to choosing a row at random. And that will correspond to uh, how many zeros essentially you have in the first column. The reason is that any zero contributes a whole block of zeros, and any non-zero contributes nothing to the bias. Because if you have a non-zero entry, then it has a Exactly the same number of zeros and ones uh, splitting here because it's a perfect small bias set. So this holds also with two because this is an inner code. If you take the first and second entry and take you know take the, par the parity of these two columns, it corresponds to what will ha what will happen if you look at the code word obtained by B1 plus B2. This code word, and you can do that because it's a linear code, so it makes sense to do that. And then again, you look at the number of zeros there; they contribute one to the bias. And the others, the non-zero, is going to be zero to the bias. So overall, it's one minus delta. Right? Delta entries will contribute one to the bias, and the one minus delta uh, will contribute, you know, zero. That's okay. Maybe that was the hardest part. Uh, no, epsilon should not be so large. So. Oh, oh sorry. Delta. Will yeah, delta will be very small. One, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, maybe that's, uh, yeah. 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 Right, right, right. So, yes. So this number of zeros, uh, or the fraction of zeros here. And a zero gives you a bias. I, is this OK? OK. So OK, so once you have this, you can just plug in codes and see what you get, right? OK, so let's see. If you plug. Don't worry if, you, if it's not completely clear, but there is this reduction. And if you plug uh, Reed-Solomon, yeah, for me, this is going to be the hardest part. If you plug Reed-Solomon, 
when Q is n, right? The alphabet size is the field size. It has to be large. And so the set size is going to be n squared. Now we want the set size as a function of k. n is just an intermediate variable for us. We want something about k and epsilon sitting here. So what's the relation between you know, n and k and epsilon? So let's see. So look at this guy. So we know that uh, you know, in Reed-Solomon, we know something very, very strong happens. n equals k plus d, right? Rho plus delta equals 1. Uh, and actually, maybe I should write it this way. So 1 equals rho plus delta. Sorry, I should write in this way to begin with. And so rho is 1 minus delta, which is epsilon, right? right this is just the single. This is because you know, Ritz-Solomon achieved the single bound. And actually, it, it would have better just to write it this way in the normalized sense, uh, normalized form. And if you look at, at this, then you know, rho is 1 minus delta, and 1 minus delta is to this. Maybe I should write it here. It's epsilon, but because of what we said about the way the parameters of the code goes to the parameter of the small bias set. But rho is just k over n by definition, right? This is just the rate of the code. So you see that n is k over epsilon. So this is k over epsilon squared. Right, so this is the AGHP construction. This is one of them. It's called the powering construction there. So this is one construction. What happens if you take AG codes? Just a fun play with parameters. Oh, maybe I should do it here, right? So what happens if you take AG codes? Then there, rho plus delta is 1 minus 1 over, say, square root of q. Don't worry about the minus 1. It won't help us. Uh, or, you know, it won't help us. So say you have this thing. And you also know that, well, so OK. So here, so the set of this, the size of the set is q times n. And so this is one thing. And from that equation, you can see that epsilon, which is, as we said, it's 1 minus delta all the time, just by the way we reduce that problem to the problem of code, is a rho plus 1 over square root q, right? Just what you get. And it turns out the best thing to do is just to you know, get, get these to equal to that, so to not lose too much. So we are going to set. We are going to set rho equals 1 over square root of q. OK, so this will give you one specific rho. But rho equals 1 over square root of q. Uh, but rho is k over n, right? Which is just the rate of coordinates. It's k over n. And so n is k square root q. I hope. Yes. So taking all that here, so you take this. It's just some annoying computation, which is much easier to do by yourself than to follow someone else. Because you don't know what he derives from where and what he puts. Uh, anyhow. But uh, this, this happens. This, I mean, you don't want n. Any, some, so this is a q to the 3 halves times k. And uh, q, we set it to be, well, I made a mess. Yes. Where is epsilon? Right, epsilon, right. Epsilon is low. Right, exactly. So it's k over epsilon q. Because epsilon is more or less up to this factor of 2 times square root of q. It's really 1 over square root of q. So q to the 3 halves is just 1 over epsilon q. Right, thanks. So this is the second construction. Right? How do you get? So this is, this is not the interesting part. The interesting part is how uh, Avi and Amnon got this construction of k over epsilon square to the free You won't be able to, to, to do this trick. So the idea was to actually, to actually look, uh, look more deeply into the, on, on this to, to, you know, to AG codes. And I need a bigger board, so I'll just use this one. And this is kind of what I hope will happen in general, that you, you won't just use AG codes. You just use the underlying math that, uh, related to those, you know, in your problems. So 
So here's the thing. So I, I need to talk about uh, Weierstrass gaps. So what's a Weierstrass gap? So say you have a function field, like we do, and you have this favorite place in mind, p0, some p, some p, let's say p0. And you're, and you're, you're asking the following questions. You're asking, does it, does it help to add, to allow one more pole at p0? So say, allow, say you look at l r minus 1 p0. Right, these are all functions in the function field that have at most r minus 1 poles at p0. Right, so clearly it's, it's, it's contained in r p0, because here you allow more, right? Here you allow r poles at p0. So definitely if you have r minus 1, you will fall into this category. But the question is, did you get more here, right? Did you get one more dimension? It's the best you can do. Did you get one more dimension or not? So if you do, if these are not the same, if you do get more, then this is called a Weierstrass pole, a Weierstrass gap. Gap means you haven't got anything there. Okay, so this is so this is this is always the case. This is equal, uh, meaning R, the, the number R, is a Weierstrass gap. You haven't gained anything. There is a gap here, so you cannot you you increase in the dimension, but because of the structure of phi, you don't gain more solutions. <laughs> and if it's a, you know one more than that, then it's called a pole. Which is a good thing in our case. And what you want to understand is the structure of this uh, Weierstrass uh, poles or gaps. Uh, okay, so let's see. So let me just write, you know, zero, one, whatever. So what do we know? And this is going to be the second definition for a genus. This is the definition we like sometimes. So what we know is the following. We actually said something. We said that from t from two g minus one onwards. The dimension is the degree minus g plus 1. So you do get one more every time you add one. So here, everything is a pole. Everything is good. Or oh, not interesting. I don't know how you look at it. But anything is understood. So these are poles. You have a function here that has exactly 2g minus 1 poles. Here you have a function that has 2g poles, exactly, etc. You, kind of, you, you, you can use the extra pole to get a new function that is not here. So these are all poles. At most one, yes, right. Yes, you, uh, maybe or maybe it doesn't follow from what we said, but yes. Uh, uh, and the question is, uh, I mean, actually it's used in the proof. So, yeah, I don't know if so the question is, what do you, what's happened here? And what it turns out is that there are, you know, you have two to the g, um, maybe I should start with two g here. Okay, you have two to the g numbers here between zero and two g minus one. Exactly g of them are Weierstrass poles, and exactly g are Weierstrass gaps. Out of the two g, half of them are poles, half of them are gaps, and therefore you can define the genus to be that uh, number. And, and you do sometimes. And what's interesting is how does these poles and gaps look like for different phi's and p. So now it depends on p also, on the, on the point itself. What's going on here onwards doesn't depend on it. But from, for different divisors in a different, different uh, algebraic function fields or you know, over different curves, you get different structures. And the question is, what, what can you say about it? Can all of them sit in, in the first half and the other here? Which would be amazing. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. So they have this, the, the poles which we want, more functions, have this annoying tendency to go there in some sense. So let me show you an example, and that's the example that was used for by Avi and Amnon. So we'll actually consider a specific uh, uh, but simple curve called the Hermitian curve, for which you can actually analyze this thing easily. So it's defined as follows. So you have p prime, or prime power, I don't care, but q is p squared. Okay. So it could be 2 to the L if you want, if you like binary. And the, the, the phi that we are considering is um, yp plus y minus x to the p plus 1. Are these familiar to you? The, 
Why people just why is the right? So what 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 function is this? You, you know, it's, it has a famous name. It's the trace of y, right? The trace from fq to fp. And this is the norm of y. Uh, norm of x. Sorry. So here, what they are saying, I want that I want that the trace of y will on the curve will equal to norm of x. Okay, this is this is the curve. This is the first example we saw actually. So let's see, let's try to understand this curve. The, the virus has, it's called a semigroup because it has a structure of a semigroup. The, the, the virus has poles of that curve at p infinity. Okay? So I want to understand at p infinity. Um, again, I need them. So do this thing. Okay. So the fact that this, and intuitively speaking, the fact that this curve doesn't have like one over x somewhere makes it easy to understand. Okay, because, um, okay. So let's see. So this is this is the numbers between you know, these are going to be the numbers one, two, three, etc. Uh, yeah, I guess there's also zero. So uh, if you want something with uh, uh, zero points at infinity, zero poles at infinity, you can take the one function. But what's more interesting is the following. I need to give you some information that I, that we, with the machinery that you have for algebraic function field, you can just do by yourself, but we cannot do. So I'm just going to tell you how much poles x and y has, each of them has, uh, at p infinity. Okay, and it shouldn't surprise you, I think. So x has, um, P poles. This is something which is easy to do, easy to do once you have the machinery. At infinity, and y has p plus one poles at infinity. Okay, take it for granted. It's not hard to do once you have the right definition of a pole and the machinery required for that definition. So okay, so x is, and, and they don't have poles anywhere else. Okay. This is why it's nice that you don't have a 1 over x there. Uh, because once you have a 1 over x, I mean, if you have a, a function field that looks like that, then uh, you know y has a pole at x equals, I mean, the function y has a pole at x equals 0. But here it's, it's all uh, non-rational in, in phi, so it's kind of nicely behaved. They do not have poles anywhere else. Uh, no other poles. So once you have that, it's kind of uh, easy to fill this, uh, this out. If you want a function with, uh, well, I don't know about two, but if you want a function with in p, p infinity, p times p infinity, x is, is such a function, right? It has p poles at p infinity. So it sits here. This is a good example of a function with p poles at infinity. And y sits here, right? So maybe y has p plus one point at infinity. Now, we, haven't, we don't have the machine here, but you would believe me that uh, x squared has two p poles at infinity. Because you know, if x has some pole, x squared has two of them, right? And so y have two p plus one, right? Because p plus p plus one, behave nicely. And uh, y squared is going to be two p plus two. Right? And, and you can continue on. If you, if you think of some number t times p, then tp, an example of a function that sits here is x to the t. And you can fill this on, you know, increasing the y, decreasing the x's, until you get tp plus t. So an interval of length t plus 1 or something. Until you get to y to the t. Right? Replace an x by an y every time, and you get one more. So this is what happens. At some point, if t is something like p, then the intervals overlap, and you just and this is exactly what happens when you get to the two g minus one. There, you get many representations. Uh, but for our case, we're actually interested in low degree divisor. What happens before to the regime when Riemann Roch is optimal and we cannot improve it? And so, say say you are interested in uh, some degree r. So you look at r times p infinity. So how many poles more or less you have here? Vastas poles. So how many do you can physics? How many? Right, exactly. 
So it, it's something like that. It's for that. This is the important part. It's for dramatic. Because, you know, if you want to stop at R, then the T that you should consider is something like R over P. Or P you know, divided by 2, I don't mind. Is, is it tight? Are there uh, uh, more points? No, there are not more points. Yes, these are all the... Right. I mean, uh, that's not trivial, but uh, you need to know the genus. Too. Once you know the genus... Well, actually, maybe you can... Uh, well, once you know... Okay, once you know Riemann Roch, you can see where you start to get all the points. No, that's not enough. Yeah, it's, not, it's tight, but it's not uh, trivial. These are all, all, there are no functions in between these intervals. Okay, so this is what you get. You get this, okay, some R over P squared. Because, right, because if you want to get to R, and the in last interval is something like R over P, and this is arithmetic progression, so R over P squared. So R is the dimension, and this is, R is the degree, yes. and uh, this is the dimension. Exactly. So let me that write this down, because now this for me is the hard part. So this is the, this is the, Avi, Ben, Oya, and Tashma. Well, it's a code, right? So it's a code. So let me just say the parameters of that code. So the dimension, so we said it k, right? The dimension is something like r over p squared, you know, up to constants, which we don't care about. And the degree, so we have the distance. So we said that the distance is at least n. I haven't said what n is so far, but n minus the degree, and we bound the degree by something, but minus the degree, and the degree is uh, r, right? Because if you, took, if you take r times p infinity, it's degree just r. And what n is? It's the number of points on the curve. Exactly. So we need to figure that out. So how many solutions do you have to yp plus y? So the trace equals zero, and it's kind of a, I'll just tell you it's p cubed. It's not that tr completely trivial. You can prove that. It's not that hard. I mean, yp plus y is, is a linear map. So, you know, yp plus y equals 0 is either, I mean, it, the solutions are, you know, cosets of that uh, equation. Since there are most p solutions, and you have to cover all of the Q, you can show that all of them are full. And actually, p plus 1 is always an element in fp, so it will always give you a solution. And now you can show it's p cubed. It's just some annoying thing to show. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. This is. This is the whole point. You want right. You want exactly. Even the genus you want that. Yes. Point. Yeah. So this is why they 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 went off for it. Uh, I mean, for uh, a like right. standard, you would expect a spatially cubed Right. And here you get instead of q squared, q to the three halves, as opposed to q, which you expect. Yes. Well, it's a high degree. It's a great p. Right. That's true also. Not only now. be able to have so many to the degree of right? Yeah. yeah. No, but. It's just yeah. right. It's not. It's just right. Yeah. For the degree, that's uh, what you, the best you can hope to get. And yes, the best you can hope. To, I mean, it could have been the case that they sit in extensions and they. No. Yes. Okay. So now, now, now this is, is for me, this is the hard part. So let's see. So what the epsilon bias said that you get just a computation, but, uh, you know, let's do it for a second. How you will pick about half? Uh, let's see. Okay. I don't have the answer. <laughs> so, so what are the what is the epsilon bias set that we will have? So remember, k, uh, the size of the set is n times q, right? Which in our case, so n is p cubed, q is p squared, so it's p to the five. This is where you have the five counter, okay? Right, because this is p cubed, and this is p squared. Now, okay. Epsilon is 1 minus delta. Delta is the relative distance. Essentially, it's so, right. So, delta, right, is kind of d over n, recall. And so, in our case, it is going to be, uh, delta is going to be 1 minus r over, sorry, d over n. I need to divide by d over n. It should be easy. Uh, 1 minus r over n. So 1 minus r over p cubed. I, I don't like the n. I like the p cubed. Uh, so this thing is r over p cubed, right? Um, what else? Uh, 
And of course, we know what R is. R is just, so this is how we choose R. So R, because we know, yeah, so. Yeah, I want, I want it from here. So, yeah, so maybe I should say that epsilon squared is r squared over p to the 6, because we have r squared here. I don't know, maybe easier. I told you this is the hardest part. r squared, so it's, uh, you know, k p squared, right? So it's k p to the 4. It's k p squared over p to the 6. It's k over p to the 4. Right, r squared is k p squared, k over p to the 4. Uh, so p to the 4, so maybe p to the 5, which is what you, you really care about, the sample, the sample space size, the set size, is p to the 4 to the 4, you know, 5 quarters. And I write it this way because p to the 4, we know exactly what it is. It's k over epsilon squared. So it's k over epsilon squared to the 5 quarters. And this is, why, this is what you wanted. OK, so that's, that's quite cool, I think. So do I have like two more minutes or, yeah? So I want, I want to say some, one, I want to say two things. So for me, one thing is to find more applications of this theory because I think it's yeah, cool. Like eight minutes. Eight minutes. So I can talk about philosophy, my philosophy point of view about this. So yeah, so uh, what I like about this uh, result, besides the fact that it gives us something that we didn't know, is that it uses a, a bit you know, it, algebraic geometry a bit more deeply than what AG codes use. They don't use riemann roch theorem, which actually is, is, deep, is deeper than what they're doing. But they are, uh, you know, brave enough to go to see what happens in low degree divisors. Divisors below what riemann roch tells you is optimal anyhow. And they gain something by doing that. And you can actually show they can't gain too much because, I mean, what, will, what you do want to happen is that most points will sit here, most poles. And then for a low degree, you can get a lot of dimension. Uh, and that's what you want. But it turns out that uh, there is this uh, bound, which I'm going to probably not name correctly, the Castorevo bound, uh, which says that this cannot happen. These points try to get, go there. Okay? And so the question is to understand better uh, how the poles uh, behave below, you know, below the two genus. And we, we don't understand that. It's not a theory that, a, theory that, a question that was actually asked by people doing algebraic geometry because it's a weird question. It asks uh, things about the irregularity as opposed to what you can say for a general curve and general place, which is more typically of our question. Uh, if Mark Strauss was interested in it, then it's uh, yeah, yes. not such a weird question. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's true also. Uh, but yeah, but there is no, I mean, the literature is from, from our community. I mean, the only thing we know. Um, and, an, and another problem that's actually I find interesting is uh, making Varstas poles explicit. So what do I mean? So here is a, here is a question. So or making Riemann Roch spaces explicit. So say I give you a you know a function field and a place, and I give you R. So the function field is part of the algorithm, but I give you R, which is for me is the main parameter of the input. And I want you to tell me yes or no whether or not R is a pole or gap, and if it's a pole, give me a function with that uh, you know, valuation, that number of poles. So this is a you know, simple question. It relates to how explicit AG codes are. If you can do that, then you can immediately uh, find any, any specific entry in the generating matrix. And no one knows how to do it kind of strongly explicit. What they know how to do is to find the basis for this riemann roch space, and then check if it's the same dimension of that thing. Right, and then know the answer, and they can actually find the function, but they take time, which is polynomial, a very large polynomial, so in R. And you want something that runs in nine polylogarithmic, you know, the description length of the problem. You want strongly explicit constructions, um, which will also give you strongly explicit codes. Uh, and I mean, they, people don't know how to do that. I talked to some people, they said that, uh, you, you can look at the papers, what you see is that the thing that you do is kind of global, it requires you to work with all of these together, or it requires you to estimate some things with uh, up to uh, some exponentially small in R arrow. So, in, so in some sense, you cannot avoid that in current techniques. So, you need different techniques. So, this is one question that. Uh, I don't understand. I mean that. Uh, so, for me, a metric. I mean the, ma the generating matrix for the code we are interested in. 
Yes. So, you know, they are exponential in size, but they are dimensional. Yeah, you know, what, what I'm saying is that currently the way AG codes, uh, the matrix works is that I can give you the entire matrix in time, which is polynomial in the matrix, but I can't give you an entry. I understand, yeah. but it's not clear. It's needed, really, because no, it's, no, no. it's you know, very different than the expander game. Right, right. You want an expander of size exponential, yes. so that this will be polynomial time. If that's what you want in polynomial time, the most Yes, for coding, coding theory, right. Okay, yeah. that, that's true. Maybe in coding theory it's less uh, motivated. But for example, the work uh, we have with Amnon uh, requires exactly that. Uh, yeah, but maybe for coding theory it's less. Uh, but I think it's a natural question. Just, uh, yes. For example, for polynomials, it's very easy. You want a polynomial of degree r, it's just x to the r. Right? That's it. In the Hermitian, it's also very easy, right? Uh, you want something with degree p plus 1, I can just give you that or figure out if it sits between the intervals. But for other function fields, uh, the emission is not that good. So for good function fields, uh, you, no one knows how to do it, even for a given specific function field, not, not, not in general. So this is one nice question that I think is interesting. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Thank you.